alumni, parents, and guests to uh, Living Writers. Uh, we're excited about today's guest author and to offer this program online to you. Um, we're excited. We've had a really nice turnout online from a variety of different people that are really excited about this kind of opportunity to engage uh, in the classroom experience. <coughs> Uh, in particular, today we, we already have a lot of people online and we also have an undergraduate student who's studying abroad in Spain right now who's watching and a welcome, a welcome to her uh, and others. Um, so this is great. Again, thanks for, um, for being a part and allowing us into your classroom. Um, again, for our guests who this may be new for, uh, we do have two cameras in the room. Um, I have a microphone here and I'll be passing that off because this microphone is important for everybody that's online that is using this. The microphone here is for the room, um, so we'll make sure we're conscious of that exchange and we're able to get our questions heard online. Uh, we do invite our folks that are online to ask some questions. Uh, talk amongst yourselves about the kinds of things that you uh, think about the book or what you're hearing today in class, um, and we do have an opportunity to bring your questions into the room uh, as their best fit. Um, obviously, the priorities are our undergraduate students and the experience they have here, but uh, we're grateful to be able to offer uh, your questions here live uh, when we're able to. Um, I think that's more or less it. Um, I want to hand the floor over to uh, Professor Jennifer Bryce and again extend our thanks for allowing the alumni community and guests to be part of the class. Jennifer Bryce. Do I need it? I think you do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and, and welcome, everyone. Our guest today, Ladette Randolph, is the author of a prize-winning story collection, This Is Not the Tropics, and a brand new novel, Sand Hills Ballad. She's the recipient of many prizes and awards, including a grant from the Rona Jaffe Foundation, a Pushcart Prize, a Virginia and Faulkner Award, and three Nebraska Book Awards. Her work has been re reprinted in Best New American Voices. Ms. Randolph studied at the University of Nebraska and worked for many years as an editor there, first at Prairie Schooner and later at the University of Nebraska Press. For the past year, she's been editor-in-chief of Plowshares magazine and a professor at Emerson College in Boston. A fifth-generation Nebraskan, Ladette Randolph edited two volumes of place-based writing, The Big Empty and A Different Plane. She's reading today in her capacity as a fiction writer, but I want to dwell for just a moment on her gifts as an editor. When she stands up in a moment, she will strike you as a modest, quiet, and self-effacing person, which is exactly right. But you ought to know that she is also, in other not-so-rarified circles, regarded as something of an oracle. <laughs> At conferences, I've seen gymnasium-sized rooms fill with people waiting worshipfully to hear from Ladette. And I've seen otherwise self-possessed writers practically fling themselves at her feet and beg her to read their manuscripts. It is not an exaggeration to say that while at the University of Nebraska Press, she single-handedly changed the landscape of nonfiction in America by publishing writers who's wor who work in hybrid, experimental, or otherwise risky forms that no mainstream publishing house was willing to touch until after Ledette. As she said in class today, as an editor, I'm open to odd things, not the same stuff everyone else is publishing. I'm looking for the thing that might surprise me. Formally, a Sand Hills ballad is not a particularly risky novel. Like a ballad, it's straightforward storytelling in the vein of psychological realism. It is not regional writing in the sense that no one outside the Midwest would have any reason to read it, but regional writing in the more expansive sense that it seems a piece with to actually have sprung from the place where it is set. Writes Mary Clearman Blue of the novel, Ledette Randolph knows well the rhythms and variations of life in Nebraska's sand hills where men and women face loss without complaint and celebrate their days with a love of family and land and community that runs like a quiet stream beneath the seamless prose of this novel. Where the novel takes risks and pulls off great feats, to my mind, is in subject matter. As my colleague Jane Pynchon has observed, 
admiringly. The novel's protagonist spends about three quarters of it sleeping, dreaming, and sleepwalking through her own life. As the novel opens, Mary's struggling to wake up from a coma, and I quote, in that deep sleep she dreamt about the wind. She heard it whistle under the window sills and through the cracks of an empty house, heard it rattle the loose no hunting sign on a weathered post and slam open and shut again the sagging door of an old barn. The story of Mary's awakening from this literal and metaphoric sleep, her awakening to free will, to new love, to her parents and her children, to church and community politics, to the scalding beauty of the natural world, is a paradox that is both as simple and as profound, as timely and as enduring as the very, very best ballads are. Thank you. Odette Randolph. I'm not sure I didn't know my microphone. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I think it might be a bit of an exaggeration that people were throwing themselves at me. But, um, <laughs> um, and thank you, Jennifer and Jane, for inviting me here um, uh, to be on this beautiful campus. This is my first time at Colgate, my first time in Hamilton, and my drive here today from Boston was wonderful. Um, and welcome to everyone in the room and also our online folks. Um, welcome. This is great. I love this technology. Um, I'm going to start the reading today um, by a short pa reading a short passage of Willa Cather and her great Nebraska novel, uh, My Antonia. Um, this passage is um, chronicling uh, the narrator, Jim Burden's uh, ride in the wagon. He's come from Virginia and he's just coming to his new home on the prairie, he's nine years old, and coming to live with his grandparents. And of course, this is set at a time in early settlement in eastern Nebraska. And my novel takes place in western Nebraska, where things have maybe not changed quite as much as they have in eastern Nebraska. There seemed to be nothing to see. No fences, no creeks or trees, no hills or fields. If there was a road, I could not make it out in the faint starlight. There was nothing but land, not a country at all, but the material out of which countries are made. No, there was nothing but land, slightly undulating. I knew because often our wheels ground against the brakes as we went down into a hollow and lurched up again on the other side. I had a feeling that the world was left behind, that we had got over the edge of it and were outside man's jurisdiction. I had never looked up at the sky where there was not a familiar mountain ridge against it. But this was the complete dome of heaven, all there was of it. I did not believe my dead father and mother were watching me from up there. They would still be looking for me at the sheepfold by the creek or along the white road that led to the mountain pastures. I had left even their spirits behind me. The wagon jolted on, carrying me I knew not whither. I don't think I was homesick. If we never arrived anywhere, it did not matter. Between that earth and that sky, I felt erased, blotted out. I did not say my prayers that night. Here, I felt what would be, would be. Um, I'm going to read just three short excerpts <coughs> from uh, the first chapter, or rather, from the first section of this novel. And I'm not going to set them up. I think they explain themselves. Um, but they have to do mainly with the relationship between the protagonist, Mary Rasmussen, and the family that she marries into, um, the Needham family. She had been driving that day in Rock County, Nebraska, on the lonely stretch of Highway 183 between Taylor and Bancroft, when the Chevy pickup ran out of gas. It was her fault. She hadn't thought to check the gauge after the sale in Burwell, where she had gone to bid on 50 red Angus yearling heifers from a breeder in Wyoming. It was May and the grass looked good, and they'd decided that year to run a few extra cattle. Plus, they wanted to experiment and breed a few red Angus first calf heifers with their Hereford bull. 
John trusted Mary's ability to judge quality stock, and he often sent her alone with his blessing to bid if she found anything worthwhile. No one, least of all Mary, had any idea how it was she did it, but she could look at a group of calves and know if they were sound or not. Each time before she went to a sale, John reminded her to trust her instincts. She had good instincts about other things, too. At that morning sale, she had bought as pretty a bunch of heifers as you could hope to find. It was risky to bid on cattle when you didn't know the grower, but somehow Mary had never made a mistake, and she trusted she hadn't made one now either. She and John would drive up together the next week in the cattle truck to get them. There wasn't a house to be seen for miles in the Skull Valley there north of Rose when the truck sputtered to a stop. Already she knew John would rib her mercilessly about it, wondering what on earth she'd been doing that far north of Burwell when she was supposed to be heading home after the sale. He would have known, though, without being told what she had been feeling that day, driving for the sheer life of it through the sand hills in springtime. She had gotten out of the truck to walk, not that she thought she would make it to a ranch house on her own in that desolate country, but she figured someone would eventually pick her up, someone would eventually stop, and she hadn't wanted to wait. As it was, she walked over three miles before a faded red 69 Ford ton, three quarter ton stopped for her. The driver, an older man, leaned across the passenger side seat and looked at her through the open window. That's your Chevy back there? Yep. You in trouble or just walking? I guess you could say I was in trouble. He pushed open the door. Get on in then. We'll see if we can't figure out what's the matter. Mary got into the passenger seat, but before the man could turn the truck around, she stopped him. I already know what the trouble is. I ran the truck out of gas. <coughs> the man nodded once, pushed his cowboy hat back, revealing his white forehead, and scratched at his hairline. She thought he might scold her, but instead he grinned and looked across the seat at her. Even those damn Chevys need gas now and then. Mary didn't say anything, but she smiled and nodded once, and he headed north down the highway. Mary knew without being told the man driving the truck owned miles and miles of the hills they were driving through. She could see it in the way he looked out across the horizon, the sand hills green with sand blue stem, six weeks fescue and soapweed dotting the roadside. He missed nothing with his focused gaze, his eyes were faded in his dark face. She could tell he knew every inch of that land through every season. Like the man beside her, Mary's father and grandfather had the look of men who were used to seeing across long distances in a wide open country. Men who could spot within a split second out of the corner of an eye if anything was out of place in all of it. This man was as surely one of her own people as Mary had ever seen. Finally, he turned off the highway onto a dirt road at another turnoff, a wooden sign said Needham Ranch. He drove another mile on a two-track two trail as it wound around behind the shaggy hills until finally a rambling two-story house with a gabled attic and a wraparound porch came into view. There was a corral to the south and loadout chutes. Outbuildings were scattered around the house and a large barn stood farther to the south. From the number and size of the tractors, trucks, and hay rakes, Mary knew it was a large operation. In one of the corrals, a dozen saddle horses came to stand against the fence to peer at the truck as it pulled into the yard. A little sorrel they were breaking was snubbed to a post in another corral, and in a nearby pasture, a few mares grazed with new colts. An old pump stood beside the yard. Along the foundation and in front of the house, inside the fence, were well-tended flower beds. The only trees Mary had seen for miles were those near the house, large old cottonwoods, elms, and red cedar. As they pulled into the yard, the man cut the truck's engine, and five boys came from five different directions. The man sitting beside her chuckled softly, flies to honey, he said as the boys, three of them young men, gathered around the truck. None of them looked at Mary directly, though she felt them stealing sideways glances. A woman came to the back door of the house, wiping her hands on a dish towel. She wore a dress covered by a black and white gingham apron embroidered with little flowers across the bottom. She had auburn hair, brown eyes, and a pale, unlined face. Now, as the man got out of the truck, Mary did too. An old collie hobbled lamely toward the man, and he stooped to scratch her between the ears. In response, her long tail swished and beat against his pants leg. 
The boys still made no sign to indicate they had noticed Mary, but the woman came toward her and stretched out her hand. I'm Iris Needham, Mary Rasmussen. I don't suppose Gus introduced himself, Iris said with an accusing look toward Gus. Gus shrugged. These are our boys, Iris said, and started with the oldest, Larry, Kent, Brian, Jeffrey, and little Billy. The boys all smiled shyly before looking away from her. They were handsome boys, the three oldest around her age, Mary guessed. I'm just making dinner, Iris said. You've come at a good time. She isn't here visiting, Iris, Gus said. Her truck needs gas 20 miles back. Gus, that don't mean she can't eat a little, does it? I didn't say it didn't. This exchange sounded gruff, but Mary sensed no real tension. One of you boys have time to take some gas back to her truck? The boys all shuffled a little as Gus asked this. Mary guessed they were used to taking orders from Gus, and none was willing to volunteer for fear he might suspect they were too interested. Gus pointed to the one Iris had just introduced as Brian. Brian, you fill up the gas can and go with her. She can follow you back. We'll fill her up, her truck and her stomach, he said, looking at Iris. Brian left to fill the gas can and within minutes took Gus's place behind the wheel of the Ford. Mary crawled back into the truck beside him. She had always been puzzled by how other people made decisions. She had instincts, that was all. Like knowing as soon as she got into the truck beside Brian that what at first she had thought was an accident, running out of gas and being picked up by Gus Needham, hadn't been an accident at all, but her destiny straight up. She'd had fun with a lot of boys, but she'd never gotten set on anyone, not until Brian. She'd known as soon as they exchanged their first smile across the seat of that old red Ford truck that she had just met the man she was going to marry. She was 19. The Needham spot a used single wide trailer house and parked it 300 yards from the main house and it was there Mary and Brian moved after the wedding. They moved in on a cold dry day at the end of the month, the wind blowing a gale that kicked up so much dust and sand they could hardly see the house when they returned from their honeymoon. They'd taken the horse trailer and camped for two nights with the horses on the dismal river. Those two days had been perfect, the autumn air crisp at night and the trees in full fall color. But after they returned to the Needham Ranch, the wind blew for days. Now and then, it gusted so hard at night that Mary woke from her sleep, disoriented at first about where she was, and afterward laying awake in fear the wind would topple the trailer house. Mary didn't care much about a house or any of the things that went into one. She hadn't really known what to make of all those fancy wedding presents, vases and bowls and wall hangings, most of which she and Brian kept boxed up because there was no place for them anyway. They were all still in boxes stored in the second bedroom of the trailer house. Mary hadn't thought about the trailer where she and Brian had lived together. Now, though, she couldn't get it out of her mind. She saw over and over a forlorn picture of the trailer house standing empty on the prairie. She thought about all of their things still there, silently waiting, about how they had left the house the morning of the accident to visit Brian's cousins in Oconto. She could not remember in what condition she had left the trailer. Had she made their bed? Had she washed their cereal dishes? Or were they still sitting dirty in the sink? All this time later, had the rooms been left undisturbed, their life together caught in mid-motion? Or had Iris gone into the trailer and cleaned up? Mary could see her going to the door with that intention, but stopping short of crossing the threshold, too intimidated by the powerful memories lurking there. Some of Mary's friends who had come to visit her after she got married thought it was a terrible setup living in her in-law's backyard like that and in a dumpy old trailer house to boot. But Mary hadn't thought about it that way at all. Gus and Iris and the boys had always been respectful. They never came to the trailer unless invited, and the truth was she and Brian didn't spend much time there except nights anyway. They ate most of their meals at the main house, spent most days working outside. It had been exactly what Mary had wanted for her life, a dream, in fact. In early November, long after they had promised, Gus and Iris came to take Mary home for a weekend. 
There had been a cold snap that week and a sub-zero wind pulled at their coats as Mary followed them to the new Ford pickup they now drove. Neither Gus nor Iris commented on her prosthesis, but Mary noticed both of them stealing glances as she walked. Between their discomfort and her parents' obvious reluctance to let her go, Mary felt like a little girl going on her first sleepover. John and Frisia hovered even after Mary got into the truck's cab, and they lingered in the driveway waving as the truck pulled away. Mary wondered briefly why Gus and Iris had brought the truck instead of the Mercury sedan as mile after mile the three of them rode packed together in the bench seat. Iris talked aimlessly to fill the time. Her chatter quickly got on Mary's nerves and Mary was curious at her own impatience. She hadn't remembered thinking of Iris as irritating before this. Gus, meanwhile, was silent for the duration of the drive. Mary could see how hard these months had been on him. She knew how he had counted on Brian and her to help on the ranch this summer, believing he would have an extra hand again this year when instead he'd been short by two. The stoop of his shoulders was more pronounced than it had been the day they visited her in the hospital. The boys were all at the house and when they arrived, the boys were all at the house when they arrived, reminding her eerily of her first visit as once more they came from all corners together around the truck. They were standoffish toward her like they had been at the hospital, watching closely as Mary got out of the truck, curious, she guessed, to see how she would maneuver on the new leg. As if to answer their curiosity, she smiled after closing the passenger side door. I've got on my contraption. Do you want to see it? The boys relaxed. Billy nodded. Wait till we're inside and I'll show you. Gus carried Mary's overnight bag in through the back door. Iris had gone in ahead of everyone and had a pot of coffee already brewing. Inside, Mary felt a pang of nostalgia as she smelled the familiar smells and glimpsed again the yellow kitchen. She was wearing sweatpants and she easily pulled up the loose bottom to reveal her new left leg. Only the boys were comfortable with this demonstration. Gus and Iris both hung back. Mary had the distinct feeling they didn't approve of the exhibition for some reason, as though she were being unseemly. Mary felt confused suddenly by their obvious disapproval, felt herself a stranger again and her former feelings of comfort and belonging dissipated. She was taken aback by the sudden sharp anger she felt toward both Gus and Iris. In their discomfort, she felt a judgment she had long suspected. What they would never ask was why she, rather than Brian, had been driving the night of the accident. The answer was easy. Brian had been tired and she hadn't been. She knew without any of them saying it that the Needhams believed if Brian had been driving, the accident would not have happened. She had not seen the Needhams in their first moments of grief but she thought she could imagine how it had gone. Iris would have wept in the bedroom with the door closed, and she would have thought to herself if it had been any of the other boys or Gus, she could have talked to Brian about it. He alone of all of them would not have been embarrassed by her tears or his own. She would have understood in that first instant how lonely her life would be without Brian in it. Gus would have gotten into his old pickup and driven up into the hills. He would have cut the engine and let the silence fill the cab. He would have looked out across the country where he had lived all his life, into the distance, blue with spring, into the starry night sky, clear and black, and he would have thought about his surprise that Brian's life would not go on as his had. Like Gus, the boys would have found solitary pursuits, and the family would never have spoken directly together of Brian's death. Now into this silence, Mary had come, a reminder of everything they had lost. She was the one person whose presence forced all of them to confront the pain they wanted to forget. She slept in a spare room in the house that night, and the next morning first thing, while the sun was still a pale, cold light in the east, they drove together to the cemetery at Rose. The Mercury's doors rang in the cold as they slammed them shut, and they stood in a circle around the stone. Brian Edward Needham, born December 10, 1953, died March 5, 1980. You weren't able to help us make any decisions, Mary, Iris said. I hope the stone is all right. Mary looked up. Of course it's all right. The wind blew, and the boys shuffled and stomped their feet in an effort to keep warm. Mary shoved her hands deep into the pockets of her coat as they all stood mute before the stone. She felt keyed up, unable to focus or to feel anything, distracted by the Needhams and their enormous grief. There was clearly no room for her here, no place to join them in their mourning. 
The air grew humid and it started to snow. Despite her warm coat, Mary shivered with cold. The gloom made it difficult to see into the distance where every one of them longed to look. Billy kicked idly at a tuft of dead snakeweed near the gravesite. Everyone except Mary kept their heads lowered as if afraid to reveal their feelings, afraid to see hers. She felt nothing standing there except a weariness of life so deep she couldn't imagine ever truly living again. Finally, when they began to steal glances at her, questioning to see if they had spent enough time, Mary smiled at them each in turn, first the boys and then Gus and Iris. She felt they could barely tolerate the fact of her existence, as though if they could erase her, they could perhaps pretend that Brian had never lived among them, as if that erasure could take away their sadness. Even had she wanted to, she knew enough not to speak of Brian in their presence, knew that to violate a code so deep would be the greatest transgression of all. It was as though she had traveled somewhere distant from them and had returned only to find they could not hear the tale she wished to tell. Thanks. I wanted to say thanks. We have folks from Wisconsin, Spain, mm -hmm. D.C., and even Elmira, New York online, and they're talking between each other, um, and we're waiting for them to prompt a question in the room. So why don't I leave the floor open until someone online okay. chooses to ask a question, um, and if, again, if, only if there's time allows, but uh, the room is yours. All right. Does anybody have a question? <clears throat> that we didn't answer in class today. <laughs> it's pretty exhaustive. Okay. Yes. Um, the reading you did where you talked about Brian, how uh, Iris would have, if it were anyone else, uh, Brian would have been in the room with her and he mm -hmm. wouldn't have been afraid to kind of show the emotion that seems to not be shown through a lot of the other characters. Was that a conscious choice to put that kind of description in there to let them know that like, that was a theme that was kind of not going to be present in the rest of the book now that Brian was removed from the, from the story? Um, the question is, um, was I consciously thinking about um, the, the little section there with um, singling Brian out as being more emotional and unusual in the family and, and Iris's sort of recognition of that? Um, very, that was a conscious choice, and I did want to um, stress sort of Brian's uniqueness coming out of this place and uh, the stoicism that he inherited and um, the kind of sense that um, the, the, I guess I, I really said it a lot in this little section, that you're not allowed to talk about painful things and, and there would be nothing more painful for this group of people than losing a child. So, yeah, that was a conscious choice. And you know not all my choices were conscious because in the conversation today I kept saying, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm a little at sea because I have read the book, but I understand from Jennifer's introduction that you, most of this is written from the state of a coma. Is that correct, or asleep, or just asleep? No. <laughs> the scenes that we just heard, are those waking scenes, or sleeping scenes, or? No, the, the question is, um, someone who hasn't read the book is, is wondering, based on um, uh, the, the introduction, if these were dreams scenes, and no, they're not. The coma, the book starts where she's waking up from the coma after the accident, um, but I think what Jennifer was saying was that this is a metaphor, that she becomes a sleepwalker sort of in her life, and then the story really is of her recovering her life through a long process of re-engagement and, and oh, coming alive course. again. It's not any like, comparison between dream life and, and waking life? Um, she, sort of no, there's no comparison between dream life and, and waking life. No. Um, no, I wouldn't say so. Yeah, Jane. Could you speak about the silences? Yeah, the question is um, about silence in this novel, and um, it is an important part of the novel, 
because um, the sand hills are very um, sparsely populated. Um, so there's a literal site. It's very quiet there. Um, it's also an endangered ecosystem, one of the most dangerous and or most uh, fragile ecosystems in the world. Um, but I am I'm interested in that concept of stillness and silence in, in narrative. And um, I don't know if you've read um, Charles Baxter's great essay about stillness. Um, he does uh, talk at length about a Nebraska writer, Wright Morris, who is um, little known but should be better known. And um, Wright Morris was really brilliant about taking time away from the action in a scene and to concentrate on the details. And, and so he, he stalls the action by, by concentrating on what's present. And so I did try to do that in this novel, and I hope I succeeded, um, because I think that it's, it's a contemplative novel. As much action as, in some ways, there's a lot going on in the novel, but it seems quiet. And that's why, because I, I really wanted it to be about people who are um, kind of quiet people. They're people of action but there's a, there's a real stillness in the center of their life. I don't know if I achieved that, but yeah, it's important to the novel. Yeah. You talked about the Needhams not being able to talk about their grief over Brian, and do you see that as um, kind of a, the issue for Mary, that she's unable to talk about her grief, and that's why she has so much difficulty with getting on with her life? Um, the question is, um, in this passage where I mentioned that the Needham family cannot talk about their grief, and is this, does this play a role in why Mary has a hard time moving forward? Um, yes, I think that's very important as to why she doesn't move forward, and her own family is very stoic and very silent, and they don't know how to interpret what she's experiencing because they only understand it as laziness. They don't understand <coughs> depression, so someone who can't seem to function anymore is just, it, it mystifies them. And yet they know she's not lazy. So there's a real problem, you know, for her to, to move forward. That's why she has to do it. She has to figure out how to do it on her own. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mike, he's a class of 92. He's actually from Elmira. Mike, thanks for writing in. He wanted to know, how has living and writing in Nebraska helped evolve your writing, if at all? Um, well, I don't know how to answer that because it's so part of my life. So I don't really know um, how it's made me evolve, except that I know um, that when I read other um, Plains writers, I know that I'm working in a tradition. I know that there's a kind of voice there that is distinct, and it may not be real familiar to people here, but I, I saw someone nodding, and I know she's from Colorado. And, um, and, I th and there's another student here from Utah. And I think that there's a kind of Western ethos and um, a kind of way of being in the land that's maybe a little bit different. Um, there are a lot of, um, I know that there are a lot of regional writers here too, um, but th there's just something kind of distinct about it. And uh, so I would say I'm very much influenced by where I lived. I now live in Boston. Um, I have a, a new novel I just finished, and uh, there's a character who has moved to Boston, but has lived there for 20 years. And uh, so I'm sure I'll start writing more about Boston, but I think I will always write with a kind of um, expat's eyes, you know? I, I think I'll never completely be a Boston writer. Yeah. Um, the question is, when I was writing the novel, was I thinking about the place or the character? Um, <coughs> well, I, the character came to my mind while I was actually driving on that highway 183, which is very lonely. And um, so I, I saw the character, but the character was immediately in her setting. I, I knew that this character had to be in this setting. and so. She is very much driven by that place, that, that it has a profound effect on her. Um, and so I think that they're almost interchangeable. I don't know that I could, could say that one came first. I mean, the landscape is, was, was really important to me, and I think it's important in the narrative that it, it, I, it comes up all the time. It's, it's like another character. Thanks. Elizabeth, did you have a question? <laughs> um, I did about the silence. 
sounds good then. <coughs> what you just okay. said about face reminded me of another question I had. Um, you kind of already answered the silence question. Um, place is obviously really important to Mary, and she kind of defines the ranch as her home, and like the end of the epilogue, um, the like very last paragraph, she like, looks back <coughs> toward the house through the snowstorm, and she like knows her home is there. But um, during the question and answer session during the class, you said that um, even though you live in Boston now, um, your books and your husband are still in Nebraska, and that's where your home is. So I was wondering if, for Mary, there are concepts or things or people that she could also define as home, as opposed to just the place of Nebraska and the ranch. Oh, boy. So you're thinking of my husband and my books, my possessions. Right. <laughs> my husband would love to be considered one of my possessions. Um, the question is, it's such a complicated question, it's a little hard for me to repeat it for the online folks. Um, so I hope they can figure it out from my answer. Um, sort of that question about things that are also resonant and not just landscape. And um, obviously at the end of the book, Mary does leave. Um, and in the epilogue, we learn that she has moved on and um, she can't go back to the ranch because they've sold it and it's too painful for her. Um, but she's moved forward. She has her children and she has um, a new marriage and a job that clearly she is invested in. So um, I don't know, you know, that's an interesting question about resonant um, objects, and um, I, we don't see her doing that, but I have to assume that in some ways she she's comfortable where she is, and that she's not just grieving for the past. You know, I think that she's moved on. Does that answer your question? <laughs> and why begin with the Potter quote? You didn't explain it. You just began. Mm. Well, um, I love my Antonia, of course. Um, I wouldn't say Cather's been a huge influence on my work, um, but I, I like her work a lot. And again, I, I hear that plain spoken, that plain language, which I think I inherited and uh, is very um, just typical of the plains. Um, I like that section of, of her novel because it's, um, it tells me so much about that place and how it does erase you. When you're standing out, uh, I have a section in, in this novel that I didn't read, I thought about reading it, where Mary comes home from the hospital and she steps out of the car, the family car, and she has this feeling of um, being very small in the world. And because the sky is so huge and it just erases her and she sees her place as very small and um, it, it comforts her because she feels that, um, I, I, I don't know why that comforts her. And maybe for some of you who've grown up on the coast, maybe your experience, if you've been on the water, it might be similar to that experience where you're, you're out in the open and it's just you and the sky and the sea. And it's a, it's a different feeling than being here in this kind of cozy, wooded place. Um, you're really exposed and you see yourself as this minuscule person. And I think she feels kind of liberated by it because she feels that um, <coughs> her choices, uh, their consequences aren't huge. Mm -hmm. I think that's what she says. When we were um, between sessions, you said that you were surprised by the fact that no one had asked a question about the abortion or some of the more controversial pieces in the novel. Um, would you speak to that? Jane's asking about um, a comment that I had made between the class and this reading about um, my surprise that no one in the class sort of brought up some of the more controversial elements in the novel. Because although it's described as an old-fashioned novel, when you start really breaking down the pieces, there are some, pe some bits here that you know, do deal with, with controversial issues. And one of them is an abortion. And, um, um, it's kind of handled in a way that um, it's up to the reader to decide what they think about this, but it doesn't shy away from the fact that it happened and, that, um, and the consequences after, after it happens. And the character that decides to have an abortion is, um, uses, it feels guilty and uh, blames other people for that decision. Um, so I don't know what else to say about it. I, it's a turning point 
in the novel, certainly. And um, I didn't think about it being controversial until I wrote it, and then I realized, oh yeah, <laughs> that might be kind of controversial. Yeah. I don't know if you would consider this controversial or not, but I did have a question about a moment when at the fundraiser, Ward gets up to pray at the end for everyone, and the way that it's described, obviously you as the author, but I also thought of it as Mary, the, the main mm -hmm. character describing it, um, says that when he stands up to pray, he spread his legs and wide and and clasp his hand, he spread his legs wide and clasped his hands at his crotch, and. There was just something about it that made the act of praying and the way that it was described something that was perverse, something that was like <laughs> weird and like gross. And for me, it coincided sort of with this moment in Mary's story when her own faith was changing a lot. And I just wondered if that was something that, you know, Ward being someone who perhaps is more of an emptier character, at least as Michael describes him later in the book. Um, it, how, how do you think that true faith is manifested? Oh dear. Well, <laughs> that's a different question. Uh, I'll go back to the first question about uh, the description of, of him praying in a way that is, seems like kind of a, a sexually aggressive way or something that struck you as weird. That is deliberate. Um, again, you know, I, I don't do a lot of deliberate things, but that was deliberate. And um, it, it felt to me like the way he takes charge of that situation, he's using this kind of, um, again, we talked about this in class, you know, this political moment to capitalize in some ways. And he has this kind of authority and confidence that a lot of the people in this audience don't have. And uh, so she does see it as an act of aggression. She's beginning to see him in a different way. She's always kind of seen him as benign, but she's increasingly suspicious of Ward as she goes on, and, and we find she has reason to be by the end. So those are kind of little clues to his character, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of the reviews I read online um, after reading the book said, categorized the novel as a novel about uh, the female struggle and I was kind of surprised about that, and because I, I didn't think of that when I was reading the book as much. Uh, I know it was related, but um, so well. My question is more broadly about fiction: is do you worry that um, if a novel has a female protagonist, it's immediately categorized as a book about female struggle? And if so, how do you combat that? Um, the question is, do I worry as a writer that if I'm, I have a female protagonist that um, the work will be immediately understood to be about women or about women's struggles in particular? Um, I don't remember any reviews talking specifically to the book being about a female struggle. Um, uh, I guess I'm a female and um, I think you know the struggles of women or the lives of women are interesting, so I don't feel like I need to apologize for that. And I think that um, male writers have written very convincingly about um, female struggles, and uh, it's been a, the problem of women. You know, if you think about the 19th century novel, it's the problem of women, and and in a lot of ways that was in my mind as I was writing this book that it was sort of taking those 19th century concerns and placing them on a contemporary um, Western backdrop. And so, you know, for me, it was a private thing. No one else has noticed that, but that was what kind of helped me as I was writing the novel to think about what it was about. So I, I guess I'm unapologetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I noticed a lot of traditional examples of um, some sort of gender roles. Um, Iris Needham, for instance, is confined to the kitchen. She's not consulted for a lot of decisions um, on the ranch. Joel Mason's uh, normal-sized wife is described as a gifted seamstress and cook. Um, she kind of uh, embodies the ideal uh, brainless domestic female. I was wondering if um, you were trying to make any commentary on um, the setting, the time period, um, or the physical geographic location that it was set in? 
Um, he's asking if uh, I have a couple of uh, characters that are described in, in very traditional female roles, of um, domestic roles. Well, first of all, I don't think there's anything wrong with those roles. Um, I, I mean, Mary's fairly critical of, of Jeanette because she's kind of mad because she feels like she's being compared unfairly. Um, that's interesting. I, 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 um, I don't think I was trying to make a big statement about that. Um, I believe that I want women to have choices. I want women to do what makes them happy. Um, and most of the wor women I know who work are also very domestic. You know, they're, they still cook and they take care of their kids and maybe we're all doing too much. I mean, there might be, that might be a complaint. But I also have women that are very strong in the novel, the, the grandmother and the mother, Mary's mother. And Mary herself, before she um, has the accident, and that becomes a struggle to become a strong woman again. Um, so, but I wasn't trying to be dismissive of women who make those choices, and I'm not. And, and I'm not making a comment about the time period because in the '80s, you know, there were many, many professional women in this country, and that was a time when women were really coming into their own and had been. So, yeah. Um, could you talk a little about? Mary splitting in two and having two cells. Okay, I, um, Beth is asking me a question about at the probably the part of the novel that you is where you either stay with me or you say I don't I don't buy it, where um, the protagonist um, decides to marry again and she marries someone that um, she doesn't love and that the reader doesn't like probably either. He's kind of more of a bumbler at that point, though. He's not really a bad guy. He's just, he's kind of unaware and um, clearly doesn't fit very well with the ranch culture. And that's not, you know, that's okay that he doesn't fit there. Um, but she has, she's realized something. She's been trying to get back into the ranch life, life that she loves, and she's had a fall on her horse, and she's um, vulnerable because she realizes that she really can't do that for the rest of her life. And she also realizes that she's probably not going to get married again if she stays on this farm, this ranch, and um, she's going to be living with her mom and dad for the rest of her life. And that just seems awful. And so I think she looks at this as, here's an opportunity. And it's, it's, it's just blind optimism. She thinks it's going to be okay. And so she sort of switches off the critical part of herself and goes forward and um, it doesn't work out but she's just kind of thinks it's the only choice she has and given her situation what are her choices we can see where oh you know she should have done this and she should have done that but she doesn't see all those things so does that answer your question kind of. well about like the split it like Another question, well, a question formed when you're answering. Um, do you think it's like essential for people to split at one or several points in their lives, and then is it also essential to come back or like reconcile the split? She's asking about um, do I believe that um, it's essential for people to split in their lives and then to come back, to become whole? Um, well, no. I don't think that's a good thing. I think that um, this character does that, and I think she does it to uh, rationalize something. But I also think that she's a traumatized person, and that trauma is a wedge in people's lives. And so there's not her, the narrative of her life is disrupted. And so she has to take what the rest of the book is really about her trying to construct a narrative, trying to stitch together a life again that she can tell herself because there's a big rift in the middle of her life. So that, that kind of doubling that goes on there is, is maybe sort of symbolic of what's happened to her, the before and after. I think Ladette will stick around to answer a few more questions, and I know to sign your books. Thank you again. Thank you.
you did such a great job re answering questions again. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And like I said, send some information.